online live broadcast, and I will study up there. And I'll be just away from every, and I put, even while I'm up there, I'm putting headphones on and listening to some music, like classical music or something like that, to just zone everything out and just think and study and think and think and think. And it's been a real blessing to do that, okay? Now, if some of you call and you say, Pastor Mike, please, hit, okay, and if I've got time, I will. If I'm recording, I won't, but if I've got time, I will. I'll talk to you on the phone, or sometimes I'll just pick up the phone, hello, you know, is this Pastor Mike? Yeah. Wow, you answered the phone? Why not? Um, in the email situation as well, I, the, the, all the emails were coming to me 24 hours a day, nonstop. And when the email comes in, I knew that I had to do something with it right then or it would be 200 emails lost in a day. Okay? And it was consuming all of my time and I finally and I did and I hope I really wish this guy would get in touch with me because I, I cannot begin to tell you how bad I feel because I answered one in haste and it sounded ignorant okay and that really bothers me and so God used that to say Mike that's enough and so all the emails don't come to me anymore they go through to different people the personal ones like you say pastor I need your advice on this that will come to me, okay? And I will deal with it. But I no longer have the burden of handling every single thing that comes in here. And that, I appreciate Gary and Alicia and, and Rose and even Ariel helps out. And she lives already in already Phoenix. And, and she helps us out. And it's just a blessing. So I don't want to lose touch with anybody, okay? But I can't be everything to everybody, okay? My primary responsibility is to study this book and to know what's in this book. And God has already blessed that. So anyway, Joanne writes in. And Joanne's a good friend of our ministry, and we appreciate it. We'd never meet, meet some of these people, but that we can just tell that they're good friends of us. Uh, here's my question. It says in Scripture that the two shall be one flesh. You've explained that when a husband and wife are together, the baby is the one flesh of that union of marriage. I understand that, but what about couples that are unable to have children? It's a good question. Okay? Couples that are unable to have children. I don't know that I have an answer to that. I will say that I know that God is in charge of birthing babies. Okay? God opens a womb or he closes a womb. And he does it for his glory and for his honor. Okay? He does it according to the wishes and the wills of his kingdom. Okay? I've known people who could not have children that they adopted children. Okay? And thus, in adopting children, they provided themselves to be a blessing for a child who... Would, here's, a, here's some parents that don't have a child. Here's a child that doesn't have parents. They belong to one another. Okay? And even in an adoptive situation, you can clearly see how that the mother and the father, even though genetically their child is not like them, but through growing up in that house, that child learns from them... And there are a lot of similarities there. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? And so I, I don't necessarily understand, um, you know, this as far as that, as far as how the question is phrased is concerned. But I do know that God is the one who is in charge of that. And God always has a good reason for it. Okay? And so that's, you know, that's that. A um, guy named Mike says, uh, in the book of Luke chapter 23. Let's turn there. Luke 23. Verse 43, the Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus tells the prisoner on the cross that he'll be with Jesus uh, in paradise. His paradise is the same as heaven. Uh, thanks for your time. And Jesus, uh, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. One of the things that we know about the underworld, the nether parts, the nether regions, the pit, whatever you want to call it, is that at the time of Christ, there were two sections of it. There was hell, and there was Abraham's bosom. Okay? It was still captivity. It was still a holding place. But it was all of those who had the faith of Abraham from the Old Testament days up until Christ. Okay? 
And so we know that when Lazarus died, he did not go to hell. He went to that place with Abraham. And so it, it may very well be that paradise would refer both to Abraham's bosom being a place, because the ones who were in Abraham's bosom were not in torments. Okay? They were not in torments like the rich man was in hell. We know that in Abraham's bosom there was water because he wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. So we know that the blessings and all of this stuff were being reserved for those who were in Abraham's bosom. So it may very well be that paradise, the term paradise, applied to both the heavenly realm here and Abraham's bosom there. But when Jesus went to preach there, after he died on the cross, the Bible says he set the captives free. And so they were released from that, and I believe, according to Scripture, taken into the paradise of God and set free. And so I think literally Jesus meant what he said here, and, that, and the man on the cross was with him in paradise listening to Jesus preach that gospel to those in Abraham's bosom and those in Abraham's bosom are saying we're going home today yeah. amen okay and those in hell are going Ugh. actually it's louder than that all right uh, let's see here Denny writes to us and says what is the strange fire in Leviticus 10 1 the Bible says and Nadab and Abihu the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord which he commanded them not. Now there's two ideas about this. Number one, everything about the service of God had a prescription. Everything had a formula to it. Everything had an absolute perfect way that it had to be done. Remember about carrying the Ark of the Covenant. You can't put it on a new cart with two oxes. Four Levite priests have to carry it. Not four Judah people. Not four people from Naphtali or Gad. Four Levite priests had to carry this. There was a formula for the anointing oil that was given. It was part of this and part of that, and it was compounded, and it was put together, and that was the oil of anointing. And God even said, now I, I, this, this is neat, God even said that nobody other than the priest should ever have that smell on them. Okay? Nobody should. I mean, God was pretty particular about it. Now, the censer that um, is the censer and the fire is incense. And incense is a picture of prayer in the Bible. Okay, does everybody follow me? Incense is always related to prayer in the Bible. And so it's, it's highly possible that Nadab and Abihu, when they had the censer, and they put incense thereon, it was a strange incense and a strange odor that was being offered up. The spiritual application of that in, in today is there are people who are offering up alternative prayer styles to God. When I pray, I speak, either with my mind, my heart, or my lips. That is what prayer is. Prayer is asking. Prayer is not hearing from God. Don't let anybody tell you that. Prayer is asking. You hear from God through the Bible. That's God communicating. But you'll have people telling you, see, prayer goes two ways. When you pray, you've got to be willing to hear from God. No, when you read the Bible, you hear from God. When you pray, you ask. But now we have a new prayer style called contemplative prayer. It's a meditative chant. You say a chant over and over again, and then you are drawn into a meditative, hypnotic state near that's sort of the level of drunkenness or sleep. That, today, is strange fire. It is strange prayer practices before the Lord. And so that's, that's my take on it. Uh, Perry writes in and says, Pastor Mike, my wife and I have a question about the biblical definition of sorcery. We've heard it's, it is drugs and wizards, etc. What is the real biblical definition of sorcery? Thank you for your ministry. We love you and pray for you always loving Jesus to you 
from your Canadian friends in Christ. Hey, there we go. Um, Caleb, go get those plates off my desk. Okay? I, I, lo I love this. I'll tell you what, I love you Canadians. I really do. Um, anyway, oh, Roy up here, and these are folks are from uh, Cambridge, Ontario. Okay? So anyway, Roy comes in here with, uh, he's got, he said, Pastor, I got a gift for you. Okay? And he said, I got plates for you. Okay? And uh, it's, get a close-up of this, Matthew, okay? It's the Canadian leaf, and it says, hey! Okay? How's it going, eh? Okay. Uh, my wife and I have a question about the biblical definition of sorcery. Now, uh, Perry, I, I think I understand where you're going from, okay? Now, I happen to know about four or five words in Greek that underlie the text of the Scriptures, Okay? And one of the words used in the, in the Bible where sorcery is mentioned is a word called pharmakia. Now, there are those who take that, and what does that sound like? Okay. There are those who take that and say it is forbidden of God in practicing witchcraft if you take any kind of pharmaceutical products. That is not true and it's not biblical. Okay. God allows us to use physicians and things of this world and we understand that the things that we do for our health are temporary solutions to a sin problem can I hear you say amen, amen. I believe that drugs are overused I think the pharmaceutical companies at their core uh, I think there's an evil agenda behind some things that are going on and I agree with that okay but there's some out there who are saying the pharmaceutical companies are part of the new world order and that they're going to kill off six and a half billion people and reduce the population of the earth let me say I disagree with that and here's why pharmaceutical companies want to do one thing and that is what make a lot of money you can make more money off seven billion people than you can five 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 million okay and what I'm telling you is all the evil things of the world they're not all on the same side and playing on the same team okay and I, I do not believe for if I believed it, I would not be doing it. I take some prescription medication that helps me with a tremendous amount of pain that I'm in. In fact, I'm in it right now. Okay? And I take it almost daily. I used to have high blood pressure. And for a while, I took a little pill that brought my blood pressure down. And after a while, I didn't have to take it anymore. I don't have, I don't have blood pressure problems anymore, and I don't take pills for it anymore. Okay? And I'm just telling you, it is not the mark of the beast for you to take a prescribed medication from your doctor. That's not wrong, and it's not, you're not practicing sorcery and witchcraft. Okay? But there are some people out there, and if you, dis if you disagree with me, I respect your disagreements. Okay? But what I'm telling you is, if somebody tells you because you went to a doctor and he put you on something, 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 that that's sorcery and you're going to hell, I'm going to be honest with you. My doc, the doctor that I go to, to my knowledge, is unsaved. But I've been going to him for several years and I've learned to trust him and I think he knows a little bit about what he's talking about. And I've got just a little bit of confidence in him that he's not out to kill me. Okay? And so, if he says, Mike, I think we're going to try this, I say, you know what, let's try it. Let's do it. Okay? And he's helped me in some ways. So please don't... And now again, there are some bad medicines out there. And we all know it. I do also believe that the Food and Drug Administration, the people who are assigned the duty of making sure that drugs that were released into the market are safe, I believe that people are human beings and they can be bought off, and I think the pharmaceutical companies know that. So there's no doubt in my mind that there is an evil presence there that's not good for everybody. Not everybody is built the same and designed the same. Some people don't ever take anything just because they don't want to do that. I know an old preacher who told me, he said, my dad went to get...